Hey guys, so I'm going to try walking you through how to find the distance to a Cepheid variable star if you're given the period luminosity curve, like the one we see here in this image. So I've written a checklist. We're going to follow the steps in this checklist one by one to finally find the distance to that star. So first things first, we have to determine the average apparent magnitude given the period luminosity graph. So that's the first thing we'll do. So let's go ahead and use a blue pen for that. And to find the average apparent magnitude, we're going to return to the graph right here. So looking at the graph, the first thing I want to do is first identify where my curve actually is. So I'm going to be using the dotted line, the dots here, so the circular black dots, and I'm going to trace them with a generic shape. doesn't have to be perfect as long as it just kind of highlights the curve so that I can identify where my points need to go. So the next thing I'll do is go ahead and draw some horizontal lines to mark out the lowest point of my graph and the highest point of my graph. So the, the highest points and the lowest points of the peaks of this graph. So if I take my line right here and drag it all the way out, it's going to end up drawing, it's going to end up intersecting with the vertical axis, which will be helpful in me for me to determine the actual values. So here, the 25 and the 26, these numbers that we're seeing here are the um, values of apparent magnitude for this particular star. But in order for us to get the actual average, we need to figure out what this value here is and what this value down there is. So if this was 25 that I'm just now erasing, then if I scroll up and look at the, the next number up, I notice that this was a 24 here and this is the 25 here, which means each of these increments here are moving in units of 0 0.2. So this was 24.2, this is 24.4, this was 24.6. So this, our blue line, crosses a little bit below 24.8. So we can say that maybe it's 24.85. So this would be one of the two values we'll use to find our average apparent magnitude of the Cepheid variable. The next one comes from the bottom line that we drew originally, so this one down here. Now, in order for us to find its value, we do a similar thing that we just did. So knowing that this is 26, that's 27, these are all moving in increments of 0 0.2, which means that our blue line right here crosses between 26.2 and 26.4. So it probably has a value of around approximately 26.3, so we'll use 26.3. Now, so I have 24.85 and 26.3, and I have to find the value, uh, the average between these two numbers. So let's go down and start working that out. So my average apparent magnitude is 24. Point, what was it? 24.85 plus 26.3. And I have to divide this by 2 since anytime I'm finding an average of two numbers or any amount of numbers, I have to divide the sum of all those numbers. So I add up all the numbers and then I have to divide by how many numbers there were. So 24.85 plus 26.3 gives me 51.15. When I divide that by 2, I get 25.575. So I'm taking my numbers with as much accuracy as possible, so I'm including you know, several more decimal, decimal points than I would originally have rounded off. So this 25.575 is the value that we're going to use for lowercase m, in the distance modulus. So if we remember the distance modulus, which we'll ultimately have to use, capital D for the distance, is equal to 10 to the power of lowercase m, so apparent magnitude, minus capital M, or absolute magnitude, plus 5, all over 5. So we'll come back and take a look at that equation at the very, very end, which will give us the distance to the Cepheid variable. So now the next thing on our checklist, we've done number one, so now we've crossed that off, and now we can go over to number two, which says find the period. So 
In order for us to find the period, let's go ahead and take a look at the graph again. So now we're using a pink or a purple pen to follow the work that we're doing for that. So the period is given in terms of days between the first peak of the graph and the second peak that follows immediately afterwards. So I'm gonna draw vertical lines in the graph here to figure out what the values of those points are. So that's my first vertical line and now I'm gonna draw my second vertical line on the successive peak that came right afterwards. So again, reading off the values of my x-axis, I can see here that this line crosses the x-axis at just about 0 0.4. Since this is 0, this is 0 0.5, which means all of these are moving with increments of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, which means that my line, my vertical line that I've just drawn, is almost at 0 0.4. So I'm going to go ahead and call it 0 0.39, and we'll use 0 0.39 for our calculations. But that's just the first vertical line. The next one is in a similar predicament. It's not exactly on the tick mark that we see on the horizontal axis, but it's right before it. But again, this is 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1 which means that the vertical line we have drawn through our graph probably has a value of about 1.39. So we'll use that. So now the two values that I need to figure out how many days are between this and this point, so we're going to figure out basically the number of days here. I have to subtract this number from that number. So going back down and now finding out where the period is, or what the period is, capital P gives me my period, so this is going to be 1.39 minus 0.39. So if I subtract those two numbers, I have exactly one day for the period of this Cepheid variable. So what that means is that this Cepheid variable is going from bright to dim to bright over a one day you know, length of time. So now that I've found my period, I can go ahead and use the value that I just found, so one day, to find the absolute magnitude using Levitt's law. So Levitt's law relates the period of the luminosity, so how long does it take to you know, go from bright to dim to bright again. So Levitt's law takes that value and it associates it with the absolute magnitude of the star. So it says capital M, or the absolute magnitude of the star, is equal to negative 2.78 times the log of P, which is the period here, so we're going to use that value in P in the second minus 1.35. So all we really need to do now is plug in 1 in the place of p. So we've got negative 2.78 times the log of 1 minus 1.35. So in order for us to actually solve this, I can use either a scientific calculator or I can use my phone. Um, and use the simple calculator app on that. I can show you both ways. So first things first, let's go ahead and use a scientific calculator app. So if I were to go ahead and multiply or you know type out the numbers there, I get negative 2.78 times the log of 1. Now this number down here is the base of the logarithm. If there's no base that's been specified, you can automatically assume that that number is a 10. So that's what I'll go ahead and put there. Now I have negative 2.78 times the log of the period, which was one day, minus 1.35. And that equals to negative 1.35, which is pretty convenient since it's an easy number to remember. So I got negative 1.35 as my absolute magnitude. So this is an important number to also remember. So going back to our checklist, we've now also completed steps two and three, which means we're down to the last step, which is to find the actual distance using the distance modulus. So the distance modulus capital D is equal to 10 to the power of apparent minus absolute magnitude plus five all over five. So now if I have this equation here, I need to plug in the values that I just found 
for apparent magnitude and for absolute magnitude. So I know my absolute magnitude is negative 1.35, so that's what's going to be plugging in here. And from the very first step, I had 25.575 as my apparent magnitude, so that's what I'll plug in here, so 25.575. So plugging in those numbers, we get the following. We got 10 to the power of 25.575 minus negative 1.35 plus 5 all over 5. So again, I can jump over to my calculator and plug in these numbers. And when I do that, my numerator becomes, let's see, so that becomes 25.575 plus 1.35 plus 5, which is 31.925. So we get 31.925 up in my numerator, so I divide that by 5, and we get 6.385. So now 10 to the power of 6.385 gives me 0.095, and the unit that I'm going to get for the distance in this case is parsecs, because anytime I use the distance modulus, my distance, the value I get for distance, comes out in parsecs. So now one quick thing we can do is also remember how to use the metric system and scientific notation. So I'm going to write this answer in scientific notation, and I'm going to make use of the metric prefixes to go ahead and kind of condense how I represent it. So take the decimal and move it forward as many times as necessary to bring it right behind the first non-zero digit. So it's going to show up behind that first two. So you get 2.426610095 parsecs. But now what's really special is that you've moved this over six times. So our order of magnitude is 10 to the power of 6. So what I can do here is say that our final answer becomes 2.426 blah, 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 times 10 to the power of 6 parsecs. But using the prefixes in the metric system, 10 to the power of 6 is also referred to as mega. So I can round this off, and let's say if I'm going to cut it off after the second significant figure, I get 2.4 mega parsecs, or about 2.4 million parsecs. So we've been able to go ahead and find the distance to that particular Cepheid variable using the period luminosity curve that we had and Levitt's law. So hopefully this has been helpful and you have a better idea of exactly how to work through the worksheet and it's given you a little bit of clarity, but if we still need some help, we can definitely look through it again in class.